Okay, in this video I want to have a look at what the syllabus calls paradoxical scenarios. Um, there's two, well there's actually three that the syllabus talks about, but I'm going to talk about two today because we've already done the third one. I'm going to talk about the twins paradox and the ladder in the barn paradox. Now these are out of the text, section te um, chapter 10.4. They start on about two, page 288. Now the twins paradox, you've probably heard it before, but People get confused about what the word paradox means and how it applies to this setup. Look, a paradox is just uh, an outcome that differs. The, it's a contrary opinion or a different outcome uh, from one person to another. So you could argue it either way. The para means, um, it's a Greek word meaning um, something like side or beside. Um, you've heard of like para paralysis, for instance. The lysis means to be broken, the para means the side. So it's referring to people's limbs who who's, uh, mightn't work very well. But in this sense, um, the dox part means a an opinion or something that's written or recorded or spoken. You hear it as documents, you've seen it as documents. So a paradox is something that is an opinion that is beside the normal opinion. And that's where the, um, I mean, that's what the paradox is about. Two separate opinions that don't seem to make sense. But the, the important point is how do we resolve the, this paradox? And the syllabus will ask you to be familiar or describe or explain um, a paradox. Now, it'll probably be a short answer question, maybe, you know, three marks or something. It'll, it might just say, explain the twins paradox and how it is resolved or something like that. Three marks uh, might have give you more um, clues to it than that. But that's all the syllabus um, expects you to do. You don't have to do um, calculations, but I'm going to do some because I think it helps you understand how it all works. Now the twins paradox is pretty straightforward. Um, <clears throat> let's imagine this is Earth and we've got a rocket ship that's going to leave Earth go off into space and then come back and land on Earth. So, and there's going to be a twin aboard each one. So that's what the twins part is. So let's imagine we've got the Earth twin and then we've got the rocket ship twin. So there's the rocket ship and we're going to have a rocket ship twin aboard the rocket. So there's two people involved and they'll end up with different opinions. Now, let's say they're both 20 years old. So 20 years old at the start, 20 years old at the start for both of them. Now <coughs> the way the paradox goes is <coughs> this. The rocket ship goes off into space. So something like this. It goes off into space and comes back 30 years later. So it goes to some place here and then comes back and then lands back <coughs> on the uh, surface of the Earth a total of 30 years later. Now that's according to the um, travelling twin or the, uh, the twin aboard the spacecraft. Now what happens is this. So the, the rocket twin will say 30 years has passed for that trip. So when the rocket twin ends up back on Earth, another 30 years will have passed and he or she will be 50 years old. And they'll look 50. 30 years has really passed. Um, according, the rocket twin wouldn't have noticed anything different. The heartbeat would have been the same, the ageing the same, and would be 50 when he or she returns to Earth. Now, <coughs> you know that <coughs> the time from moving object. Now we're assuming the Earth is stationary and the rocket is moving and coming back. So you know that um, time is dilated. This person on Earth would see a dilated time for that journey, for that event. And let's imagine they see the event as taking 50 years and the person on Earth will now be 70 years old. Okay, so the twins when they come back, when the rocket ship is back on the surface of Earth, now remember we're talking about 
we're pretending or we're assuming the rocket ship's going off and coming back. So when the rocket ship lands again, the rocket twin will be 50 years old and will look 50. The Earth twin will have aged 50 years, 50 years and be 70 years old and will look 70. Now in the textbook I've got it drawn as this fresh face looking um, twin who sort of in middle age but this guy here 70 um, you know with sort of a beard and long hair uh, curly white hair and so on okay now <clears throat> the question is um, how does that make sense let's make some sense of it what speed like we can say what speed would they have to do to do that that'd be a calculation but that's not the paradox the paradox isn't that they have two different ages when they land the paradox is something more complicated than that but look let's just quickly do this to see what speed the rocket ship would have done now you know the formula is t equals t0 1 minus v squared on c squared t is the <coughs> dilated time which is 70 equals 50 ah uh, sorry 50 Oh no, look, we're doing the the time interval, sorry. So it's 50 is the time interval, that's t, and that's t0. So 50 equals 30 over 1 minus v squared on c squared. Now <coughs> that becomes um, 1 minus v squared on c squared equals 30 on 50, which is 0.6. Now square both sides and you end up with 1 minus v squared on c squared equals um, 0.36. Um, take that to the other side and we get v squared on c squared. Bring that over and that becomes 0.64. 1 minus that is 0.64. And then take the square roots of both sides and you'll get v equals 0.8. And we're working in units of C. So that would come out to 0.8C. <coughs> now, so what we're saying here is if the rocket ship left Earth, travelled um, to a distant planet or something like that, and then came back, if, the, if they travelled at 0.8C for the whole journey, the twin aboard the spacecraft, or the, which I've called the rocket twin, will have aged 30 years. The twin on Earth in the same time will have aged 50 years. So T0 and T and you get that set up. Okay, so that's that's the first part of it. But that's not the paradox. I mean, that's, that's the outcome of Einstein's theory of relativity. But what we've said is that it's the rocket that leaves and the rocket comes back. Let's think of it the other way around. Let's put it here. But let's do this. Here's the rocket, and there's the Earth. Okay, so you've got the rocket twin and the Earth twin. Now, some books put it, they call them the traveling twin and the Earth twin, or the stationary twin, or something like that. But that misses the point of the paradox. If you call this one the traveling twin, all of a sudden you, you're saying that person is the one who's doing the traveling. We could look at it the other way and we could say the rocket stays in place, but what's happening is the Earth's going off to there and then the Earth comes back to the initial place, basically, and the rocket stays in place. So the rocket's not moving. So what you've got is this sort of setup. There's the rocket and Earth, just like we had before. But instead of this happening, we say this is happening. Now there's perfectly symmetrical. So what you should get is that the Earth twin would have been would have aged 30 years because he's the we're saying he's now the traveling twin. So like before we said the traveling person ages 30 years, but the rocket twin who is stationary in this scenario will have aged 50 years. Okay, <clears throat> now this would have to be, um, it's the moving frame of reference, so that would be t and that would be t, 
no, the other way around. That's T0 and that's T. No, that's T0 and this is T. Okay? Because you're saying, basically you're saying, T0, you might remember we said, <coughs> only needs one clock. All right? Um, the, the start and end of the journey, that is the beginning and end of the event, happens in the same place. Well, you can imagine the rocket ship has one clock goes out there, comes back, it's the same clock. But the problem with that is, is that the Earth twin could also say, oh, I've got one clock. Now, a couple of things to this. I'll come back and resolve that little problem later in terms of clocks. The question is, which of these two is right? Now, if you, if you did this, you'd find um, the rocket twin would be 70 years old, and the Earth twin would be 50 years old. So depending on which scenario you use, if you look at this one where it's the rocket that moves, the rocket twin is 50 and the Earth twin is 70. So the rocket twin looks younger than the Earth twin. The Earth twin looks old, he's 70 years old. In this scenario, the rocket twin is 70 and looks old and the earth twin is only 50. Now the question is if you did this experiment it wouldn't matter it's that happening or it's that happening. Let's, let's imagine we agree that they're both 20 years they both look the same when they the start of the experiment but afterwards one has to be older than the other. Okay? Now you can't have one looking a bit older or a bit younger. It's, he's either older or younger than the other. In this case, the rocket twin is younger. In this case, the rocket twin is older. Now the question is, if you did this experiment, what would you find? They both look um, like they make sense. No, I haven't said anything that doesn't look like it makes sense. Now the, the answer to this is, so that's the paradox. The paradox is not that there's a difference in ages. The paradox is whether you consider whether you, the paradox is that you get two different outcomes depending on how you look at traveling twins and stationary twins. The question is which one is right. Now, with all of these um, with all of these paradoxes, there has to be a resolution. There has to be some answer um, to explain it. The question is which one is really moving. Okay, is it the rocket ship that moves or is it the Earth that moves? Now you could say, well, the rocket ship, you know, it's lighter, it's smaller, the Earth's not going to move. But this doesn't have to refer to Earth and rocket. It could refer to any two objects that are together and you have to consider which one is going out and coming back, whether it's the rocket or the Earth. Now the thing is, whenever an object moves like that, this object has to accelerate there, decelerate there, accelerate and decelerate. Now you know that any time you undergo acceleration you would feel a force pushing you from behind to accelerate and then a force which would appear to be in front of you or dragging you back as you decelerate then you turn around and you accelerate. You'd feel the forces of acceleration and deceleration. Now, the question is, um, which one is accelerating and decelerating? And the answer is, it's the rocket. The rocket's the thing that undergoes the acceleration and deceleration. The Earth doesn't. The Earth just sits there. We know the Earth is just sitting in its normal orbit. It's not going to change. Uh, it's not going to accelerate all of a sudden, decelerate, just because there's a rocket nearby. Okay, so the resolution is, because we know the rocket actually accelerates and decelerates, it has to be the one that's moving. So this is the correct one, and this one is not correct. The resolution was that we know the rocket is actually moving because it undergoes acceleration and deceleration. Now, just getting back to that last point about um, clocks, I'll just need to explain this. The question is, <coughs> I said before, well, they both would only need one clock. The rocket ship would have a clock aboard, come back, and it's the same clock above the rocket ship. 
but the Earth would also only need one clock because it would measure the time at which the rocket ship left and when it came back. But if you only considered half the journey, let's say we looked at this part of the journey and forgot about all of that. Now, I'll just get rid of all of this stuff. Now, if the rocket, whoa, if the rocket went from there to there, the question is how many clocks would you need? Now, the first part of the journey, which might be 15 years, how many clocks would you need to measure the time interval for that? Well, the rocket would have one clock, and when it lands, it would use the same clock. But what would the Earth need to measure the time for that journey? It'd have to have two clocks, and they have to be synchronized. So it'd have one clock on Earth, and another clock on the planet, or the star, or wherever the, the uh, rocket ship was going. So the rocket, the, um, the idea of having two clocks uh, as a way of deciding which is traveling and not, um, would make sense then. The traveling, the person who's traveling only needs the one clock um, for both parts of the, the starting and stopping for that part of the journey. Okay, so that's the answer to the business about the clocks as well. Okay, there's a second scenario or a second um, paradox that I'd like to have a look at and that's the ladder in the barn. So it looks like this. <coughs> now Let's imagine. Now these are these are quite famous, um, quite famous paradoxes. They're not something that the syllabus writers thought up. Let's imagine we've got um, two. Hang on, we've got two. Uh, I haven't got it here. Oh yes, I have. Let's imagine we've got a barn, and here it is here. Now, the, what's, what's going to happen with this paradox is this. We've got a person who's got a, um, a high jump pole. Um, now let's imagine this is the pole, and I'll just make a line there to show you the length. Right? That's the length of that pole. So, now if you notice, that pole doesn't fit inside the barn. So if the person with the pole, let's imagine this is the person with the pole, they're holding the pole, walks over and goes inside the barn. Now there's a door front and back. So imagine there's a door there and a door there. Now there's a farmer inside the, the barn. The person with the pole, the pole vaulter we'll call them, walks over and while they're both at rest, because the, the farmer's at rest in the barn, the person with the pole goes over there, stands inside the barn, and the pole doesn't fit. But you can see it, it doesn't fit. So the pole vaulter and the farmer would agree that the pole is too big to fit in the barn. Now, let's say the pole vaulter will be at rest with respect to this length, because what the pole vaulter is going to do is run. But the pole vaulter is at rest with respect to that length. So this will be L0. Okay. Now, what's going to happen, and in some ways the, the barn is, is immaterial in this discussion. All you're looking at is whether the, the pole shrinks or not. Now let's imagine this pole vaulter runs towards the, runs towards the barn with this pole. Now the farmer inside the inside the barn will see a rod or a, in this case a, a pole moving at relativistic speeds. Now remember we're taught this is all about relativistic speeds. Moving at relativistic speed towards him. Now you know what will happen when an object um, moves at relativistic speed. The person holding the rod still measures the proper length because they're moving along with the rod. So they're the person who measured the rod. So as far as they're concerned, nothing's happened. So they still measure L0. But the farmer will see the rod moving at high speed and you'll get the L equals L0 
contraction. So you'll get a contracted length. So what the what the farmer will see is a contracted length. Now here it is here. And you can see what I've tried to do with these two pencils is show you the initial length when it's at rest according to the farmer. The farmer would see the rest length. But when the rod is moving at high speed, you'll notice I've made them shorter. So this would be when that's traveling at V, that rod would look shorter. So it would be L. Okay. Now, as far as the farm is concerned, this rod all of a sudden fits in the barn. So the farmer would say a rod which doesn't fit inside a barn when it's at rest, when it's traveling at high speed through the barn, at one particular moment in time, it'll all fit in the barn. I mean, it'll keep going. They'll keep going. So they run through the door at high speed and that pole looks contracted down to that length and it will fit. So the first part, and remember there's two parts to these paradoxes. The first part is that the rod will look shorter and it will fit. That's not the paradox. Now some people think, oh, the paradox is that a rod that won't fit in a barn will all of a sudden fit in a barn when it's moving at high speed. That's true. That's not the paradox. That's just one problem with it. Now, what you need to do is to, for this paradox, you have to consider the other point of view, the other frame of reference. Now, let's consider the other frame of reference. Now, I'm going to get rid of this because we're not talking about the pole moving anymore. We're going to talk about the farmer moving, the farmer and the barn moving towards this. So that's going to be at rest. So it's still L0. But we're now going to forget about this side of things. We're going to look at the farmer and the pole, uh, the farmer and the barn. So there's my pole. That's at rest. Now, this distance here to the farmer is L0. And to this person, when they're at rest, the pole volter would say, yep, I agree. That's L0. My pole still won't fit in there, but I agree that that's L0. Now, what's going to happen is the farmer is going to actually, the farmer and the barn is going to move. So instead of going like that, look, I'll put this up here. You can see what I'm going to do is make the barn move like that at high speed, at relativistic speed. So instead of, and I've got the dotted lines to show the original size. So now to this person over here, the barn is contracted. So originally it was like that. Now it's contracted because this person here sees this barn approaching them at high speed. And in their frame of reference, the all distances moving in that direction are contracted. So that barn would now look this big. And of course, it's not going to fit, but it's it's going to even it's going to fit even less. Originally it didn't fit, but now it's even smaller. The the barn is even smaller and it's not going to fit well and truly. Okay, so the paradox is you know, will will the pole how can it be that the pole fits at one time under one person's um, frame of reference, but at another time the barn actually gets even shorter and it's going to fit even less. The question has to be, will the pole ever fit inside the barn? Now, it'll fit if this person here is the one considered to be running because that'll get shorter and it'll fit in the barn. Okay, now, the resolution, in t you know, there, there's two different scenarios or two different approaches there. You can see, how could this be? And there's no right or wrong, wrong answer to this. Look, I know that you could have, you could say, well, it's only the pole vaulter can run, the barn can't run. But you could take, you know, some sort of um, tube that's coming at high speed and the rod goes through the middle of it. You know, what will happen? Um, I think the only way out of this is to say, going back to our idea of um, simultaneity, you might remember 
I was demonstrating to you that if I was aboard a train and I had the light in the middle, that if I moved along like this and the light went off, I would see both doors open together. But what you'd see is the back door opening, then the other door. Okay, so it depends on your frame of reference. So in this case here, the farmer might say, yes, the pole will fit inside the barn at any one time. Um, this person might say, um, no, sorry, the farmer would say the pole won't fit in the barn when it's at rest, but it will fit when it's moving at high speed. But the question is, you know, what, what do we mean by will it fit? That means the start of the pole has to be touching this door or next to that door and the other end of the pole is at this door. That has to happen at the same time. Well, you know, to make a judgment. Well, simultaneity is a thing that is, is relative, so you can't really judge it as being um, one person right or wrong. So what the farmer judges is simultaneous, that is the pole will fit, this person will say it won't fit because the start and finish of the pole won't fit in the barn at the same time. And so the resolution is that they could be both right, it all depends on um, simultaneity and their idea of what is simultaneous and that will vary uh, based on um, their movement. So now I could do a calculation for that. Um, you could say, let's imagine, look I, I don't need to persist with this too long, but can you imagine that um, the, the uh, barn is, or let's say the rod is five meters long and it won't fit in the barn because the barn is only four meters. Now how can it be that a five meter pole can fit into a four meter barn? the five metre pole has to contract down to four metres. The question is what speed would the runner have to be going at for this five metre pole to contract to four metres? Well you just do a, a thing like this and so you get four on five which is 0 0.8 equals that. Square both sides and you get that. Okay and all you need to do now is um, take the v squareds on c squared over this side that's 1 minus 0.64 which is 0 0.36 and take the take the square roots of both sides and you get v equals or v on c if you like equals 0 0.6 or v equals 0.6 C and that's the answer. So in other words if the runner the pole vaulter went at 0.6 C with the 5 meter pole it would contract down to 4 meters and if the barn was only 4 meters wide normally uh, it'd fit. Okay. From the other point of view from the barn moving this way well it wasn't going to fit to start with and it'd fit even less. Okay so that's the resolution for that. So we've done these two. Now I said to you we've done the other one. The other one is the um, lights on a train, the flashlights on a train. Now I'm not going to do that again. I did that in uh, probably one of the earlier lectures. Um, I think it was called simultaneity. But basically that was the one where the light went off. I haven't got all the stuff here. The light went off and it hit the two doors. If it hit them simultaneously um, the two doors would open like that. Now to a person who's traveling along with the train they'd see that. To a person like yourselves who'd see the train moving or me now that the train's moving like that we would both see this up that. So we'd see that open then that open. Okay so and I went through the resolution of that so that was the third one. Now the syllabus only talks about three paradoxes. Um, I mentioned a couple of other things. I mentioned the ultimate speed in the universe as being 1c. I think that's worth keeping in mind. There are a couple of others in the textbook that you might like to look at but they're not the ones in the syllabus. Um, it's the one where Einstein drops a pot plant and it crashes 
If he's going at high speed and his wife's on the side of the road or the side of the, uh, the railway line, if he drops it, does it still smash? Because time is dilated and it's going to go a lot, well, the, the trick is will it go a lot slower? And there's some resolutions in the textbook about that, but you might like to have it go at that one. Okay, that's it. We're finished with that.